The CIA and the KGB continue this fight by each side trying to uncover traitors. In 1974, the secret services in the West bring down a man that shakes West Germany right up to the highest ranks of the state. The man who whispered in the Chancellor's ear, one of Willy Brandt's closest advisers, was actually a Stasi agent. He started one of the biggest post-war scandals in the world of espionage. His name was Gunter Guillaume, and he moved to the West at 29. With his wife, he settled in Frankfurt and joined the Social Democratic Party. Officially living the life of a normal citizen, this exceptional spy climbed all the ranks of what became the ruling party. The Stasi agents were sent to West Germany. There, they sometimes ended up in poverty, with nothing, no money, no help. The Soviet intelligence service cut contact and wouldn't support them at all. They had to make their own way, own career, until they were successful. Several did succeed, among them Agent Guillaume. It took Gunter Guillaume 20 years to reach the Chancery, 20 years spent delivering documents on the West German political orientation. When he was uncovered on the 24th of April 1974, Chancellor Willy Brandt is forced to resign and Gunter Guillaume is arrested. It was very early in the morning. Apparently, the police and the secret services always come very early. What woke me up was the noise, a racket all through the apartment, voices. And there, in the doorframe, I saw my father. He was in a dressing gown and facing all these men in dark suits. This image was completely surreal. And then, in a sort of parade, my father, my mother, then my grandmother lined up in front of me so we could say goodbye. My father didn't say a word. He took me in his arms and hugged me. My mother was completely devastated. She was saying, my poor baby, don't worry. It's a mistake. Everything will be fine. My grandmother wouldn't stop crying. It only lasted a few minutes. Then my parents and my grandmother were taken away and I was left on my own in the apartment. Pierre Baum was 16 at the time. He only has a few photos left of this family that was torn apart. He never received any explanation from his relatives. To what point did my father really believe what he was doing as a spy? What did he really think of East Germany? I'm of the opinion that over the 20 years he spent in the West, he was certainly an agent, but he'd also evolved and been influenced by the West. I think that for my father, this double life wasn't just a lie to me and others. I think it destroyed him from inside. He spoke about it much later. He said that he worked for two men. On one side, he worshipped Marcus Wolf, the head of espionage in the GDR. The other man was Willy Brandt, who my father loved. I'm certain that it was difficult for my father, right until his death, to know, to analyse what he really was. This man with two faces was tried and sentenced to 13 years in prison. In 1981, Gunter Guillaume is released and returns as a hero to East Berlin. He's welcomed by the man who made him the most famous spy in the Cold War, Markus Wolf. Gunter, 
Erstmal herzlich willkommen. Alles, alles Gute zu Hause. Gut, dass die lange Zeit nun endlich zu Ende ist. So. For me, a process was started which lasted a long time and maybe still goes on today, well after the deaths of my parents. This process maybe won't have an end because I live in a permanent search to find the real identities of my parents. Who was my mother? Who was really my father? At the start of the 80s, the Guillaume affair didn't help the relationship between the CIA and the KGB. Once again, the Cold War entered a very tense period. That's when one of the less well-known episodes began. In November 1983, the Russians are convinced that the Third World War is imminent. One man plays a key role in diffusing this situation. Klaus Eichner is now 76. He was a colonel in the Stasi. His job was to go through the information gathered by agents on the ground. In 1983, NATO began large-scale military maneuvers. The tension was so high that the Soviets genuinely feared that nuclear missiles would be fired at any moment. In East Germany, pilots were in their planes, armed with nuclear missiles, with the propellers already turning. Luckily, and I admit I'm proud of it, we had a source in the headquarters of NATO. We lived in total paranoia, especially the Soviet military heads, they feared a war, and we tried to bring them back down to earth by providing the facts. In Moscow, the authorities are convinced at the last moment that NATO aren't planning to attack the USSR. The threat of nuclear conflict dissipates. There, our agent, who we called Topaz, played a decisive role. And nobody at that time knew that we were on the brink of war. Thanks to the secret services, many critical situations were diffused in Europe. In general, it's known that governments lie and cheat. To know their real intentions, you need to have an authority with independent information to mutually keep tabs on each other. The secret services contributed to peace in Europe. They allowed explosive situations to be identified enough in advance to be discreetly settled by the diplomats. In the middle of the 80s, the war between the CIA and the KGB changed considerably. To respond to Soviet power, Ronald Reagan began the Star Wars, an enormous project for a missile defence shield. The last phase of the battle was getting started. In Moscow, these photographs that piled up on the desk of the intelligence service worried those at the highest level. The Americans were striking a blow that could be fatal to the USSR. The, uh, the ability to infiltrate agents into uh, the Eastern Bloc was incredibly difficult to do. Human intelligence was not, not something that we were particularly effective at, mainly because of the ability of uh, the Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc to protect themselves, counterintelligence. So we had to find the technical collection means. Some of this was imagery intelligence, some of this was a U-2 spy plane with satellite technology. And so the NSA decided to build uh, a state-of-the-art signals intelligence facility in the highest peak uh, in West Berlin. And of course, 
West Berlin being surrounded by East Berlin means that in every single direction you're looking at enemy territory. So it's the perfect place to put a, a intelligence gathering uh, uh, radio uh, facility. Um, and in doing so, they were able to uh, to listen even beyond just East Germany, actually into the Eastern Bloc. Um, and it was incredibly important for gathering information during that time. Teufelsberg, the Devil's Mountain, a visible sign of the advantage that the CIA was gaining on the KGB. The USSR's economy is dying. Moscow is no longer capable of financing this Cold War and following the United States. At Teufelsberg, hundreds of American agents are driving this monster of technology. 30 years later, the empty carcass of the beast remains. We're in one of the most fascinating places in the Cold War, 150 meters above sea level. Today, it's dedicated to art, but it was once devoted to the arts of espionage. From here, thousands of phone calls were listened into, as far as East Europe. It's here they were recorded, transcribed and analyzed. Everything Washington knew was based on the work carried out here. From up there, the CIA agents watching the Soviet bloc struggle and its empire crumble away. It's the beginnings of peace. The KGB and the CIA make contact. Der Austausch ist vollzogen. Zum ersten Mal konnten Kameraleute eine solche Szene festhalten. 1985, the 11th of June. It's exactly midday on the Glienicke Bridge in South Berlin. It's here that the most important exchange of spies in history will take place. From the east, a small bus just arrived. Then come uh, there was this bus ride from the prison. The pressure was so intense that I kept asking myself, what is happening? What are they going to do to me? You're not really in control of yourself in these moments. You've reached the limits of what a person can psychologically stand. On the Glienicke Bridge, a ballet of armored vehicles. The American, Richard Burt, in black sunglasses, goes out onto the bridge. He greets Wolfgang Vogel, the man who negotiated this exchange of prisoners for the Stasi. Smiles and handshakes are exchanged. Never in history have the CIA and the KGB been so close. On one side, four Soviet spies captured by the Americans are returned home. On the other, 23 agents recruited by the CIA and imprisoned by Moscow. On this bus is Eberhard Fettkenur. Klaus Pliever, who looked after the relations between the two German states, got on the bus. I think there was also the American negotiator. They said to us, don't worry, nothing more is going to happen to you. And to prove it, we're getting on the bus and staying with you. When I crossed the line that marks the border, I remember it like it was yesterday. I felt something incredible. It's over. They have no more power over me. Each side took their men. The Cold War had reached its end, and in 1989, its most visible symbol would collapse. I think the fall of the war, it was the victory of the West. Uh, it was a big victory in the West, because it 
it proved that the system they built could not sustain, could not last, and that you could not isolate a society from the rest of the world. The intelligence services are no longer a threat. 15th of January, 1990, Berliners blockade the headquarters of the Stasi. The people reclaim their history. You think, in a way, yourself, you had played a role in that? A very small one, very small one. Just a little, <laughs> little stone in a big wall. The KGB had lost this war. In Moscow, the Soviet system doesn't last long. Later, the CIA and the KGB would find themselves engaged in battle once again, but Berlin remains the place where they fought the fiercest and closest battle in almost hand-to-hand -hand combat.